Good evening, and welcome to the fourth of the Reverend Martin Darcy SJ Memorial Lectures here at Campion Hall at Oxford. Welcome to those here in person at Campion Hall, as well as to everyone in our online audience throughout the world. And a special warm welcome to the co-sponsors, Georgetown University Press. I'm Daniel DeHaan. I'm the Frederick Cobbleston Senior Research Fellow here at Campion Hall, as well as at Blackfriars. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce um, this evening's fourth lecture and to moderate it um, by Reverend Professor James Keenan. After his lecture this evening, there will be time for questions, both from the audience here in Campion, as well as those online. Those online are reminded to insert their comments into the question box in the chat box, and so that we can get to those questions here as well. Um, I'm also reminding everyone to check out the Darcy Lecture um, page on the Campion Hall website. Um, there's not only um, links to the live stream, but as well as links to the past lectures, as well as um, Jim has kindly provided very fine outlines and extensive bibliography for the past <coughs> lectures, as well as a link to um, this evening's lectures outline and bibliography references. The previous lectures in this series so far have been on grief, on the nature of vulnerability, and recognition, and they've been sort of precursors setting us up for this evening's lecture, which is on conscience. And so without further ado, I welcome Jim for his lecture this evening, Preparing the Moral Life, Conscience. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. In 2003, I founded Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church a network of roughly 1,500 Catholic theological ethicists around the world. In 2006, Linda Hogan of Trinity College Dublin and I, together with Renzo Pecadato, co-chaired the first international conference of the network where 400 ethicists from 52 countries gathered in Padua, Italy. In 2010, Hogan and I hosted with Antonio Otiero a conference of 600 ethicists from 72 countries in the beautiful city of Trent, Italy, where the council was held. In 2014, the planning committee of Catholic Theological Ethics in the World Church began thinking of hosting its third international conference in Sarajevo for those working in Catholic Theological <coughs> Ethics. Eventually, 500 participants would gather there from 80 countries in July of 2018. In order for us to get familiar with Sarajevo, two members of the faculty of the University of Sarajevo, Zorica Maros and Darko Tomasevich, invited Antonio Tiero, Kristen Heyer, and myself in the fall of 2015 and 2016 to conferences designed to respond to the struggles of the region of Bosnia-Herzegovina. These lectures helped me to develop an understanding of the socially responsible conscience, which I did by reflecting on the public remembrances of injustice as an ethical necessity. These public remembrances of injustice are at the heart of this lecture on conscience. So first, the move to a socially responsible conscience. The move to a socially responsible conscience is not an easy one. The first difficulty is the enormous plethora of understandings that we have whenever we discuss conscience. Richard Gula has written, trying to explain conscience is like trying to nail jello to a wall. Whenever you think that you have pinned it down, part of it begins to slip away. Precisely because of the broad diversity of meanings, Alberto Giubilini in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy notes that there are, quote, different philosophical, religious, and common sense approaches to conscience. Though he develops his essay precisely to define these multitudinous and variegated differences, still he writes, quote, on any of these accounts, Conscience is defined by its inward-looking and subjective character. But here arises the second difficulty. The, individual, the introspective notion of the individual conscience, as Jubilini proposes, is still quite insufficient. Inasmuch as I have been trying to highlight the connectedness of humanity 
through the ontological givenness of our vulnerability as prior even to our moral selfhood, I want to resist conscience as singularly or preeminently personal or individual in its self-understanding. Also, by following Thomas in insisting that conscience is an act and by developing the last lecture on recognition, I believe that conscience ought not to be reflecting on the self as much as on the other. Only by being other-directed will conscience ever be faithful to itself. These insights align then with three issues that I have been aiming at through these lectures. First, the underlying socially connected vulnerability that emphasizes a, social, a humble social self-understanding that complements a more individually oriented one. Second, the summons to vigilant recognition in which the more privilege and power we have, the more summoned we are to see the structures of vice as needing to be converted into structures of virtue. And third, the conscientious call to collective constructive action. These three points highlight, I think, not only a robust socially responsive conscience, but also one that needs to be more frequently imagined and developed. These are the goals of this lecture. So searching for a meditation on a collective guilty conscience. As I was preparing for this lecture, I very much wanted to offer an extended argument on the need to consider the guilty conscience. I still do. But I began searching for a prefatory meditation on a guilty conscience for each of you. <laughs> First, I wanted to share an experience that I have published elsewhere of my own visit to Dachau, where I experienced profound guilt over my own judgmentalism through a grace-filled illumination. In that narrative, I wanted to share the good of acknowledging one's guilt, but it was a fairly private and mo um, mostly about myself as an individual. But then I thought, why not go to the great publicly known guilty conscience of King David? After all, it is hard to think of any, uh, any earlier expose of the guilty conscience than King David's. In light of the prophet Nathan's accusation of David, you are the man. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own, from 2 Samuel 7, uh, 12. David's own confession of guilt is displayed for all to see. Not only that, we engage his confession of guilt as a community of faith whenever we read and recite Psalm 51, which is David's confession of guilt. Yet even in light of Psalm 51, we are still reflecting singularly on personal guilt and because I have been insisting on the connectedness of humanity as prior to both the personal and the social, I want to propose something arising from that point of departure of connectedness. Furthermore, in preparation for this lecture, I came upon two essays by relatively new, though recently tenured scholars that help us to realize that we need to get to the guilty conscience that expresses its own social rebuke as a way to further the recognition of creating a much more equitable and responsible world. These two essays propose three steps not unlike the ones I have outlined, the call to act, to recognize the other, and to witness to the interior shared social connectedness. Let me briefly turn to them before considering a worthy meditation. So recent critical works on conscience. In a very prophetic essay called A Call to Action, Global Moral Crises, The Inadequacy of Inherited Approaches to Conscience, Elizabeth Sweeney Block argues that the discourse on personal conscience is so focused on itself that its outward bearing to act for others is often overlooked. As she writes, quote, it is precisely in 20th century scholars' focus on conscience as a medium between the person and the moral law, or as the voice of God echoing in the depths of the person, that acting with and for others is eclipsed. Bloch reminds us, quote, although it is deeply personal, 
conscience as action must draw us out of ourselves and away from our own concerns. She proposes, quote, to reimagine and refocus conscience, emphasizing action and engagement with the other as equal in importance to the self-knowledge and self-reflection typically associated with conscience. She seeks to modify the reflexive conscience with what she calls is the engaged conscience. That is, a conscience that prioritizes the other and action and takes responsibility for changing unjust structures and institutions. Locke turns for assistance to Elizabeth Vasco's work, Beyond Apathy, A Theology for Bystanders. There, Vasco wants to expose the social construction of reality and the silent complicity of the larger community. She sees that our privileged status provides us ways that we can hide from social responsibility within social shelters that implicitly protect our own self-image, letting us acquit ourselves for not recognizing the social structures that oppress and compromise others' lives. As we saw in the last lecture, both Reinhold Niebuhr and Isabel Wilkerson convey the ways that society soothes our troubled consciences, insisting that we are not responsible for the very inequities that privilege and, uh, that privilege and protect us and compromise others. Mindful of them, we can, call, we can all the more appreciate it when Vasco and Bloch indict on ethical passivity, as they call it, and the vested interest in not knowing, the vested interest in not knowing. They look to interrupt our sleeping consciences that indulge themselves to protect one's moral self-image while maintaining the benefits and privileges one accrues. Bloch concludes, if we are using conscience only to dissent, to separate, to protect ourselves, and if conscience is most centrally about identity and self-knowledge, then we are not fully engaged in the work of attending to the other. Conscience can and ought to be that which pulls us out of self-concern and into the work of protecting the other. Conscience must call us into action and hold us responsible for the harm that threatens life. I like Elizabeth Sweeney's Block essays very much, as well as her other investigations. The second contribution is from Brian Hamilton in It's In You, Structural Sin and Personal Responsibility Revisited. Like Bloch, Hamilton exhorts uh, ethicists to redirect present discourse on conscience. His admonition, as I see it, is to recognize that social forces that inhibit our moral responsibility are not only externally influential, but they are internally engaged, constitutively present in the interiority of our connected selves. He begins his essay reminding us of another lecture. Now, this all depends if you know who Andrea Dwork Dworkin is, it, it, it's even all the more uh, interesting. In 1983, the feminist critic Andrea Dworkin gave a talk about rape to an auditorium full of self-declared feminist men. Characteristically, she refused to allow them any cover. This is Hamilton writing. She spoke first about the pervasiveness, the inescapability of men's power over women. She reminded them that the power exercised by men day to day in life is power that is institutionalized, protected by law, by religion, by universities, by the police but she refused to let them think that the real problem was confined to those institutions. And that's when she said, the problem is that you think it's out there and it's not out there, it's in you. You can imagine sitting there with Andrea Dworkin shouting this at you as a self-declared feminist man, saying that, oh, you really are not like the others and therefore finding out that indeed she thinks you actually think like the others. Hamilton argues that structural sin inheres not just in policies or institutions or social roles, but also in the embodied habits of knowing and willing the good that constitute human agency itself. 
Hamilton is reacting against the critical realist, especially Daniel Finn, who Hamilton argues, quote, does not provide language for talking about how structural sin shapes us from within. Structural sin, writes Hamilton, remains out there. He adds, but by conceiving of structural sin entirely in these external ways, they never arrive at a rigorous accounting of, sin, uh, re accounting of its internal dimensions, the way the structures we inhabit reshape us from within. Hamilton contends that we are formed internally by habits that predispose us, as Aristotle would say, to see the world as we are. Seeing the internal side of social influences helps us to better recognize human moral experience and helps us to better understand and act for the shape of my own moral agency and the shape of the moral communities that I am part of. Hamilton turns to Pierre Bordeaux's notion of habitus in his outline of a theory of practice and argues, quote, it is wrong to treat the social world as something outside of and opposed to the individuals who constitute it by their action, and it is wrong to teach individual action as a sui generis confrontation with an alien social world. Instead, the inner life of agents is marked by a habitus, a system of durable, transposable dispositions, structured structures, predisposed to function as structuring structures. Rather than go into Bourdieu's notion of structuring structures, I would prefer to stay with Hamilton's overriding insight that my habitus is a determinate way of being in the world, a tendency to think or act or position myself this way rather than that. Hamilton provides a summary of his argument. What Bourdieu's theory captures, and the critical realists in my judgment do not, is that part of what social structures structure is me in all my interiority, my body, my perception, my understanding, my desires, my whole self is already structured. It is not nearly enough to say that social structures influence agents only by way of constraints and enablements of our action nor does it help to appeal to culture as a supplement to these external constraints, which would fail to make the intrinsic unity of these processes of social formation clear. It is not even enough to say that structures, though existing outside of us, have a formative influence over us. The problem is that you think it's out there, and it's not out there, it's in you. Our habitus is integral, to the structure. So just think, you know, I grew up as a kid in Brooklyn. You know, I'd say that in many ways, my internal life, my reactiveness, my way of proceeding, my way of perceiving reality, of understanding this person as opposed to that person, is already in a way predisposed. That's what he's trying to get at. He's trying to say, as I said last time, that we, we want to acknowledge that structures like the police department or education or the market, the churches, these social structures influence us. They don't force us, though, because they don't have agency. Only you and I have agency. But what about we? Do we have agency? What about us? Do we have agency? And is there something internal to us collectively that we need to identify? That's what he's raising as a question. Is there something in us? So as a kid driving through Brooklyn with my father, who was a head of Manhattan South Homicide Squad, you know, Kojak, driving in a car, I saw things the way a police officer's son would see things. I was, I was Jim but I was also a police officer's son. So were the rest of my siblings. They were sons and daughters of his and married to my mother, uh, Dolores. We, we saw the world in a very particular way as a family, but then my neighborhood did. We were all Irish Catholics. When an Italian moved in, we thought that we were going through integration. It was a very different world than other people were living in, but that was our world. And he's trying to say, it's not out there, it's in you and it prompts you to see reality as it is. And that's what I'm interested in these lectures. I'm interested in how do we address this issue? 
Instead of simply saying and teaching ethics courses where we teach them, you know, deontology or proportionalism or a lot of other things, are we addressing the actual social factors, which are internal now, I'm arguing, that need to be recognized, that need to be vulnerably challenged, and that need to be able to address more positively a way of developing structures of virtue as opposed to the structures of vice that arise, if you will, on their own. We need, therefore, to acknowledge, however, that these are not all or nothing claims. Hamilton is not arguing that we irrevocably determined by these habits, but he does want us to see that we are influenced not only without, but within. While not relinquishing human freedom or human responsibility, he still attends to the presence of formative influences that predictably prompt or inhibit us both within and without. Here, Kristen Heyer makes an important differentiation. In addition to recognizing the social structures, which are non-agential but influential on human agency, she recognizes actual social agency in human collectives by talking about their social sinfulness. Here she emphasizes not non-personal institutional structures like education, the police, the market, but rather interpersonal, transpersonal, and socially connected groups of persons whose agency is not individual but plural. Any groupings from one's family, one's neighbors, the Society of Jesus, members of Black Lives Matter, these are all different types of collectives. I find this turn to social agency as a worthy place that answers Hamilton's issues about agency while still respecting the function of impersonal structures of virtue and vice. I will be incorporating this turn to social agency throughout. As we turn to the socially responsible conscience then, these authors help us to see conscience formation as a connected enterprise that prompts us to undo the oppressive forces of vice, both internal and external to us, collectively and personally and structurally, and to aim for the development of structures of virtue, especially for those whom we have not yet recognized as anything but expendable or ungrievable for their own sense of welfare. In other words, we need to think of conscience formation as an interconnective activity that examines our agency collectively and individually in the light of our social structures. It is for this reason that I now wish to turn to the beginning of conscience awakening that I contend arises from the acknowledgement of guilt. I will first give biblical accounts of how acknowledgement of guilt gives birth to conscience, and then we'll consider philosophically the matters of guilt and conscience. So, the collective guilty consciences of Nineveh and the brothers of Joseph. In light of my quest for the expression of guilt through the lens of human connectedness and the recognition of the harm to others, I find two biblical narratives that guide us toward a socially responsive form of conscience accountability. The guilt of Nineveh, and of Joseph's 11 brothers. I find the acknowledged guilt of Nineveh in Jonah 3 very helpful. The book of Jonah begins literally with Yahweh's wanting Jonah to preach against Nineveh because of its wickedness. That wickedness is named in chapter 3 as violence. Notably, there is no mention about false gods. Rather, Yahweh's concern is exclusively about how the Ninevites are treating others and one another. Yahweh's concern is about them simply as a people. After all, they are, as Yahweh identifies them, 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, Jonah 4, 11. As backward and violent as they are, the guilt of Nineveh is acknowledged notably first by the people and then by the king. In both moments, the guilt is quickly and completely acknowledged. Here, both the individual and social accountability for harming others is publicly summoned and publicly expressed. It serves, as I hope to argue later, as a helpful reason for why the public ritual of repentance is so morally relevant. 
that an entire city, each and every one of its people, and the king himself become repentant actually is unthinkable for modern times. Yet, I think it in part explains why, individual case, why individuals are so reluctant to acknowledge their own guilt as well. There are no social exemplars. The second case is not a people, but a family. I love the consciences of the brothers of Joseph. If you read the, the some, um, you know, I'd say 17 chapters uh, of Genesis, you'll, you'll get to love the consciences of the brothers of Joseph. They first want to kill their brother. Then they decide to toss him in the well. After that, they retrieve him and decide that they should sell him into slavery. Their main reason for all these changes is they want to make sure that they don't have a guilty conscience. They want to make sure that they don't have blood on their hands. That's their one issue. No blood on our hands. We can do whatever we need to do to him so long as there's not blood on our hands. Listen to this. At the outset, we see their self-interested consciences who, wanting to kill their brother, are convinced by Reuben to, quote, not draw any blood from Genesis 37 and so toss him in the cistern. Reuben uses this ploy so as to later rescue his brother Joseph. All that the others want is to get rid of their brothers with a guiltless conscience, with no blood on their hands. The text conveys the self-regarding consciences of the brother as Judah, the lead brother, suggests in chapter 37 of Genesis, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. It's wonderful. The story is too long to recount here, but it is worth remembering that after Joseph is sold into Egypt, he becomes in time a trusted executive of Pharaoh, overseeing food supplies in times of plenty and not, times that he foresaw in his dreams. When Joseph's brothers later come to Egypt for grain, Joseph recognizes them, but they do not recognize him. Joseph seeks to undo them by accusing them of being thieves. Afraid of how compromised they seem to be, they immediately believe that their precarity is due to God, punishing them for what they did years ago to their brother. They talk in Hebrew about the matter that the overseer Joseph they believe, does not understand the language. Joseph releases them, but holds one brother as ransom as he gets from them a pledge that they will return. When they, they return, they will bring with them the youngest brother, Benjamin. Along the way, Joseph makes them even more anxious by having planted his own silver in their sacks. We are told, quote, as they were emptying the sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. As their guilt arises, they are convinced again that their perilous relation with their overseer is wrought with trickery and accusation that they believe only God is causing. Still, when the impact of the famine strikes them again, they decide to return with Benjamin after all. The visit goes well at start. All seems resolved, and they seem relieved, until, while returning, they are stopped by Joseph's servant, who is looking for Joseph's own silver cup that Joseph made sure to place into the sack of Benjamin. Again, the text highlights their terror of God. And the cup was found, quote, in Benjamin's sack. At this, they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. Judah is beside himself. Now Benjamin is at risk, the youngest son of Jacob. Here, Benjamin, here Judah's sense of responsibility for Benjamin and his father emerges as he begs clemency from Joseph. Joseph can no longer bear the alienation from his brothers and reveals himself to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. 
When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now be do, not be, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Note at this point, the brothers have still not yet acknowledged their guilt to Joseph nor apologized. It will not be until years later that this happens. Indeed, the time from the act of the brothers' sale of Joseph to the actual acknowledgement of their guilt is literally decades. Chapter 50 records the death of Jacob, but with that, a new fear arises among the brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. He, here now the brothers acknowledge their guilt. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I am in the place of God. I, am I in the place of God? You intend to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Contemporary relevance of the Joseph story. The Joseph story is written by, uh, up uh, by all sorts of people in social ethics. Um, just two now here. Solomon Schimmel calls this account a paradigm for repentance, noting that the various manipulations by Joseph are there to subject his brother to the experiential situation similar to the one they faced when they committed their crime against him. Joseph wants his brothers to experience anew what they did in selling him into slavery by making Benjamin a precarious part of the negotiations. Therein, he provokes their guilty consciences. That's what he's trying to do, provoke their guilty consciences to actually rise up so that they need to be recognized. In another essay entitled Joseph and the Politics of Memory, Clark Cochran suggests that though their reconciliation is fragile and mixed with other motives, it is real nonetheless and all the more realistic for its fragility. This is not a tidy, familial, or political story of reunion in which all live happily ever after, nor are our own political stories. Remarkably, he notes, Recent students of reconciliation on efforts in the Balkans, Africa, and other conflict situations suggest a dynamic similar to Joseph's. The story of Joseph's brothers captures then the reality of how a collective sense of guilt emerges clumsily until finally it is collectively expressed with an apology. But it also reveals the difficulty we humans have in recognizing our guilt in acknowledging the harm we caused, in apologizing, and finally in making restitution to the other. It also highlights how much, because we do not want our consciences disturbed, we try to avoid blame for doing harm. Still, what I most love about the wonderfully complex Joseph story is how long it took for the brothers to actually acknowledge their guilt. Indeed, as I shall now argue, the conscience personally and socially is not born until guilt is confessed. The agency of conscience is born, in fact, only when guilt is acknowledged and confessed. The guilty conscience and the birth of conscience. In the Hebrew Bible, the term most analogous to conscience is heart. Lebab in Hebrew, Kardia in Greek. There are literally hundreds of references to heart in the Bible. Often enough, heart is that which God judges. In Sirach 42, God searches out the abyss and the human heart. God understands their inmost secrets. Sometimes God's examination of the heart empowers it to proceed rightly, as in Jeremiah 17, 
I, the Lord, search the mind and try the heart to give to everyone according to her or his ways, according to the fruits of their doings. Occasionally, through the heart, one recognizes one's guilt. We call this a judicial conscience because it judges our past actions. In 1 Samuel 24, for instance, we read that after, after, afterward, David was stricken to the heart because he had cut off the, a corner of Saul's cloak. Here the heart is the conscience convicting the self. In theological ethics, we distinguish between a judicial conscience that looks back and a legislative conscience that guides further future courses of action. There are a few instances of the latter in the Hebrew Bible talking about these future courses of action. There the word is rarely heart, but rather akin to the word to a voice. In Isaiah 30, for instance, we hear, and your ears shall hear a word behind you. This is the way, walk in it, when you, when you would turn to the right or to the left. When we turn to the history of conscience in Western thought, we discover that from Democritus on, conscience is there also primarily judicially. Moreover, while most often God judges the heart in the Hebrew Bible, Greek and Roman notions of conscience highlight the agent's conscience as doing the judging. The agent's conscience does the judging. In fact, most often, conscience disturbs as it judges. In most of ancient philosophy, the function of conscience is to distress us over our wrongdoing. The ancient notion of conscience awakens the wrongdoer with its guilt because conscience forces us to recognize our own misdeeds. In that rude awakening, many encounter conscience for the first time. Think about, think for yourself, when you were like 17, 18, 19, and, and you were troubled by something you did. And, and it's not like your parents telling you that, or an older sibling, or somebody else saying that. It came to you. Where did that come from? You had the whole plan that you were going to do it this way, this way, this way. You did it that way. You made sure you didn't need to know about other things. You did it, and suddenly you're being troubled by something. Where, what is that phenomenon like when you're 17 or 18, when suddenly there seems to be someone else, and you realize that someone else is within you, telling you that you did wrong, that you did wrong, that everything that you delighted in and aimed for and all was wrong. And it doesn't come from outside of you, it comes from within you. This experience of conscience is usually with a rude awakening. Um, to have a conscience is to recognize, therefore, our own guilt. The birth of conscience through remorse is a common theme. Cicero, Julius Caesar, and Quintilian, for instance, refer us to the ways conscience prompts us to recognize these misdeeds. In his conscience, a very short introduction, Paul Strom remarks that his, this idea of conscience was so evident that in the very popular rhetorical work from the first century, Rhetorica ad herenium, prosecutors were advised to look and see whether their adversary clients showed signs of conscience. And these were the signs of conscience. Blushed, grown pale, stammered, spoken inconsistently, displayed uncertainty, compromised himself. That meant the person had a conscience. To have a conscience was to recognize one's guilt. Additionally, as Richard Sarabi, Sarabi notes in his Moral Conscience Through the Ages, the Romans referred to this experience as the bites of conscience, coming from the word morsis, the root for remorse. Just as conscience makes its appearance in history by first being recognized for the way it disturbed the ancients, so too does it appear first that way in the individual lives of most people. Its pangs not only awaken us to our misdeeds, they awaken us to conscience itself. As we enter adult life through these pangs, we begin to realize that we carry within ourselves a moral beacon that troubles us when we are wrong. And with time, we also learn it can validate us when we are right. A guilty conscience is precisely one that recognizes a disconnect between what we thought was acceptable or what we wanted to be acceptable and the guilt we feel afterwards. By recognizing our guilt, we recognize conscience. 
The reason why we acknowledge that conscience is born through the awareness of guilt is because only if it has the freedom, only if conscience has the freedom to indict the agent, only then can it have the power to guide the agent. If it is allowed to disturb the agent, and if the agent recognizes that authority, then it has the freedom it needs to discern the truth. Then it has the freedom to discern the truth. So now let me turn to highlight differences in the birth of collective conscience in different societies. And what I want to do is I want to compare continental Europe after the Second World War and the United States on the phenomenology of conscience in these two cultures, broad cultures. My interests are not primarily here with personal conscience, nor only with social conscience. I'm interested in both. I believe that through vulnerability and recognition, we see how connected the human is. We are then not looking for a personal notion of conscience and then a social one. Rather, we need to acknowledge that we are affected personally and socially by the way conscience acts. It is for, this, for that reason of collectivity that we examine the consciences of the brothers of Joseph and not solely King David's. Turning to the collective, we better understand the way conscience functions both individually and, and socially. Years ago, I discovered that before, during, and after World War II, continental European theologians appalled by the widespread participation of Catholics in the works of the Nazis and the fascists developed a robust promotion of the call of conscience for all Catholics, a summons that, like Damo Don Lotan and Bernard Herring, sent in the 1950s to all seminaries and churches of Europe, and that would bear fruit in the celebrated paragraph 16 of Gaudium et Spes. They developed a theology of conscience because they believed that Catholics collectively had created an obediential, minimalist passivity among themselves that left them unprepared for critiquing the atrocious uh, activities of the Nazis and the fascists. Many Catholics, instead of challenging these works, participated in them. The rebirth of conscience in continental Europe began in part with collectively acknowledging the profound human wretchedness in their history. These moralists invoke conscience to judge not others but themselves. The moralists' turn to conscience was precisely to urge to awaken in Catholics emerging from the, church, from the war's rubble a sense uh, that moral agency needed to be collectively accountable. As Dorothy Soule remarked, she was filled with the ineradicable shame of belonging to this people speaking the language of the concentration camp guards. The locus of that competency was the Christian conscience. Turning to conscience in Europe was not then a matter of giving individuals the freedom to exercise prerogatives, to pursue autonomy, or even to dissent against the law. Rather, the turn was to place before each and all Christians that they were in varying ways, both personally and socially, responsible for what happened in the war. With this new mindfulness, they would ultimately be a people judged and hopefully redeemed by Christ. After World War II, Europeans began a process of understanding their capacity for evil by examining the history of their actions. That understanding continues to be visible today when one visits, for instance, Germany and sees public social reminders of the nation's own atrocities, from the concentration camp memorial in Dachau to the Berlin Memorial for the murdered Jews of Europe. We can literally see not only the horrendous treatment of human beings, but also the pangs of European conscience evident in enduring testimonials. When appeals to conscience appear much later, actually in the 60s, in the United States, in fact, during the Vietnam War and in response to Humane Vitae, they were indeed very different appeals to conscience. Rather than a social acknowledgement or recognition of guilt, they were individual protests by young men 
drafted into an undeclared war in Vietnam, or by married couples not convinced by the claims of the birth control encyclical. In both instances, the appeals to conscience supported individuals to opt out of a claim by a civil or ecclesial law, to opt out of a claim by a civil or ecclesial law. While the European familiarity with the post-war conscience was begun with the collective social acknowledgement of their guilt for profound human violations of the moral law, the American practice was about personal opting out of social claims. In fact, even more recently, the US bishops protested against the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare. They appeared to do what n Americans normally do when they turn to conscience. They say, I am sorry, but I have to follow my conscience. They invoked a conscience clause to opt out. Their consciences are invoked momentarily to opt out of an existing law, the draft, humane vitae, or the Affordable Care Act. That's how Americans use the word conscience. Unfortunately, the American use of conscience never really settled into nor emerged from the place that it did in Europe. That is, as the source of responsible personal and social moral agency that could recognize their own capacity for evil. That's what happened in Europe. They recognized their own capacity for evil. The American resistance to recognize its own wrongdoing is long-standing and well-rooted in the long legacy of American exceptionalism, in which we excuse many of our actions by presuming that our nation's greatness has a manifest destiny that exempts us from the standards that others must follow. That exceptionalism allows us the opportunity to avoid any social public expression of guilt. For instance, despite our nation's own history of enslaving millions of people and the benefits it developed and enjoyed from the enslaved lives of these human beings, uh, Americans have never collectively acknowledged the wrongfulness of slavery. As Sean Copeland reminds us, the theologian Sean Copeland reminds us, a good friend and a colleague of mine, the American conscience does not realize that it is haunted, profoundly damaged by the complex history of slavery in the United States and by its national willfulness to accommodate and profit from racism. Of course, the failure to recognize morally the history of slavery in the United States from the first slave ship's arrival in 1619 to the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865 led similarly to the failure to recognize the long history of the Jim Crow laws and with its own history of lynching so noted by James Cone in The Cross and the Lynching Tree, and as I remarked last week, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice established by the Equal Justice Initiative led by Brian Stevenson and opened in 2018. This way of being haunted, think of the brothers of Joseph, how haunted they were each time that that silver was found, each time that a guilty conscience began to surface and they did not know what to do with it. That place is the nation's, um, oh, pardon me, the Brian Stevenson's point, the nation's first memorial dedicated, uh, let me back up. The um, Equal Justice Initiative has this uh, National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which actually acknowledges all the lynchings in the United States. And that is the nation's first memorial dedicated to the legacy of enslaved black people people terrorized by lynching, African Americans humiliated by racial segregation and Jim Crow, and people of color burdened with contemporary presumptions of guilt and police violence. This is their mission statement. This is what you see when you go there. This is a witness to what happened that was just opened in 2018. This tribute was both by and to the victims. It is not an acknowledgment of the guilt of the white oppressors. This came from African Americans who raised money so that they could raise up for all consciences, like, like if you will, uh, Joseph putting silver in, the, in, in, their, in their sacks, a way of raising up that conscience could acknowledge its guilt. But this has not happened. It still has not happened. Still more and more racism is, as Barack Obama and others have named it, our nation's original sin. But because we have not confessed it, 
We, like the brothers of Joseph, do not recognize how significantly it toxifies our culture. Whenever you see, uh, you know, our gun control issues, if you think it's not connected to the slave question, then you're missing this entire thing that by acknowledging the whole history of slavery and our responsibility for it, we can see why we're using guns and how guns enable us to do what we do, like in Buffalo this week. American exceptionalism also led to the attempted extinction of Native American populations throughout the country. The legendary Trail of Tears is but one of the strategies that the United States took to wipe out the Native people of our country, never acknowledged. Other instances of American exceptionalism include the bombings of Dresden, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. All of these violent and vicious policies, the so-called American conscience, has never publicly acknowledged. The failure to acknowledge our guilt collectively affects personally the lives of American citizens and permits the myth of innocence to continue. Moreover, without any public or social apologies, American individuals do not have any exemplars of the apology. Until we can recognize the evidence of our own capacity and realization of evil in the personal and national history of our own actions, we cannot claim to have a conscience, let alone to be exercising one. Indeed, in the United States, the so-called conscience remains self-centered, exempting itself from institutional rules. I've written on this any number of times. This is not my first time doing this, so people in the States are familiar with my uh, position. So in conclusion, a few lessons to be learned. The German memorials that we have seen are reminders of guilt and sin. They are reminders, too, that people could have acted otherwise. They are not memorials to human weakness, but to human power. This is worth noting because until we confess sin, we often think we are less powerful than we were. Here is the first lesson for us to appreciate. We think we sin out of weakness until we confess, and then we realize we had the capacity to act otherwise. We always sin out of strengths. The German moral theologian Franz Bochler discussed in Fundamental Moral Theology the significance of admitting guilt. For him, the confession of sin is itself effective. He says um, it's, it's effective and illuminative. It is effective in as much as we do not know the scope of our sinfulness until we actually verbalize it and acknowledge it. When we do, we can see the history of sinful harm. Until we do, we remain behind artificial blinders, like Joseph's brothers, that keep us from recognizing the trajectory of effects from our sinfulness. Bokla reminds us that sin is not simply a question of guilt. It is also guilt in the presence of God. In that effective acknowledgment of our culpability, we are gifted with an illumination by which we understand first what we did and second, what we could have done. The confession of our sinfulness lets us recognize that we could have acted otherwise. Until we have that insight and publicly acknowledge it, we are trapped by an understanding of ourselves as weak and constrained, a convenient stance that literally keeps us from believing that we need to confess. Uh, Hiroshima, for instance, you, the, the statement uh, constantly uses the, the United States had no other alternative, no other alternative. It, the, the, this negative thing that it was not possible is really rather striking. Um, when we confess, however, we realize not only that we sinned out of weakness, but out of strength. We had other options. The myth of our weak capabilities deceives us from acknowledging our guilt. So we, we continue to reinforce that we could not have acted otherwise. We continue to think that we were weak. And we don't allow ourselves the freedom to acknowledge the truth, which would allow us to see that we had capability to act otherwise. So Bokla says, until you recognize it, until you actually acknowledge verbally, externalize it, you, until that happens, you are lost inside yourself. And conscience needs to be other directed. Second, as we saw in the Brothers of Joseph, human beings take an enormous amount of time to acknowledge fault and guilt, let alone memorialize them. 
For instance, in, his, in the first visit by a sitting American president to Hiroshima, President Obama, in 2016, 61 years after the bombing of Hiroshima, assiduously avoided any apology for the atomic attack, though clearly his visit was an act of solidarity with the suffering that occurred there. Still, this could be the laborious step on the way to finally acknowledging our culpability and responsibility. Third, without such admissions, the moral complexity of history remains hidden and the ruse of purported innocence remains. The other's experiences are left out so as not to compromise the myth. For instance, the Vietnam Memorial on the Washington Mall honors and literally grieves the 58,000 American servicemen and women who died there. There is no mention of the approximately one million Vietnamese who died either as military or civilian casualties um, on both sides from 1965 to 1975. None of their grief enters into ours, nor any of our guilt or possible apologies. They remain ungrievable. Yet our grief as a nation remains incapable of collective responsible remorse and accountability. Fourth, still, most memorials are not erected by the guilty conscience of the former oppressors, but by the insistent memory of the victims who appeal to the consciences of the <coughs> oppressors, often enough in a global context where power persuades others to acknowledge their guilt. Absent the strength of the victim, however, often it is difficult to find the acknowledgement of guilt by the oppressor. Where we see manifestations of guilt acknowledged is usually in societies where the victims are strong enough to make their case. If they're not strong enough, th this actually does not materialize. Indeed, it was, after all, it was after all Joseph who perpetually instigated his brother's confession. Similarly, it is Brian Stevenson, the African-American lawyer who built the lynching museum and not remorseful white supremacists. As Jorgen Moltmann reminds us, the real revelation of the confession of guilt occurs when the oppressor understands that one's redemption is found by remembering the victim. But that is usually, again, prompted by the victim's agency. Fifth, the public lack of remembrance and apology is not singularly an American phenomenon. While I think the United States is an easy example of this exceptional lack of re recognition of guilt, the public resistance to acknowledging horrendous complicity in oppressing others is worldwide and is far greater than the urge to publicly acknowledge and remember wrongdoing. Hopefully, though, wherever we are citizens, we might begin to realize if our discourse is so ripe with privilege and yet so terrified of blame, we might begin to interrogate whether our national historical atrocities were ever acknowledged as such. I believe that until we confess our original sins, we con it continues to infect unabated. Sixth, by the confession of our guilt, we recognize not primarily our failings, but the victims we harmed, the need for restitution and their pardon, and the vulnerable recognition of their dignity that was once so viciously compromised. The pangs of conscience awaken us to be converted toward a more vulnerable and mutual recognition. Though deeply interior, the conscience is then, as the culmination of the movements of vulnerability, recognition, and guilt, the key to our relationships with others, our world, ourselves, and our God. With conscience, we continue then to begin the process of response, as we saw in the second lecture, where we saw that after the Good Samaritan's vulnerable recognition of the wounded man, he now in conscience determines what he should do so as to bring the man back to good health. Seventh, it is worth noting in conclusion that conscience, sunatesis, appears in the New Testament 31 times, mostly in Paul, and almost always in terms of our relationship with others, for it is about our recognition of them. A key example of this is the question of idol meat in both 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14, where Paul asks us whether our conscientious decisions and freedom are mindful of the needs of those growing in faith. Eighth, make no mistake about it. Conscience is not infallible, quite the contrary, as Gaudi Mitzvah reminds us. 
But there in conscience, we understand that we are bound by the truth as it really is. Truth stands in judgment of our own misdeeds, a judgment that we recognize in the pangs of conscience. In that confession, we recognize truth not as something that we made up, but rather something that compels us. This phenomenon of obeying our consciences, heeding the dictates of conscience, and recognizing the demands of conscience captures the sense that conscience allows us to hear the truth as it is. A well-formed conscience teaches us in humility to allow truth to have its say. Thank you. social dimensions that we inherit and that, that form us as we develop and continue to influence us, um, both in terms of guilt and in, with respect to conscience. The normativity of conscience also seems to be something that's socially inherited and so maybe sometimes points beyond the norms that we've inherited and received. But you, have, you also said you wanted to insist on the idea of conscience being like an act or a kind of judgment. But some of these ways in which things are sort of seeping in socially seem more like a habitus. Right. And I was wondering if you could help articulate and clarify the relationship here between those. Yeah, I think what I'm trying to say in these lectures is that there's a notion of vulnerability and a notion and the capacity for recognition that precedes an act of conscience. That's what I argued in the second lecture. That's what I argued in the third lecture. And that if you don't have a sense of vulnerability, you're going to have difficulty doing recognition. In this, that's, those arguments that I presented are behind this lecture. They're basically saying that if we have vulnerability and recognition, maybe we can recognize where we have a guilty conscience. I think that a person has a guilty conscience, experiences a guilty conscience, and responds to a guilty conscience when they have some vulnerability and they have some recognition. Without that, they won't. So the act of conscience is to acknowledge the guilt. It needs to acknowledge the guilt. It needs to do what Joseph's brothers couldn't do for 35 years. They couldn't say, we did it. They were trying to do anything but get caught. That's, they just didn't want to get caught. So they try all these different ruses, and the entire time, Joseph is trying to keep them there. And, but notice that, for instance, Judah develops as a person all during these trials. Judah finally recognizes that he may have tossed one young brother into the cistern, but he better not do it to Benjamin, because not only will he destroy Benjamin, but he'll destroy his father. And, and the, you can see growth in Judah that wasn't there before. The stirring up of his vulnerability, the stirring up of his vulnerability, I think, leads to his capacity to recognize. But it takes a long time to get there, and it doesn't happen until at the very end when the father dies, they conspire to say, okay, let's, why don't we just acknowledge that we did it and get it over with and hope that even if he enslaves us, he'll let us live. And, and that's what they do. So I think I'm trying to say vulnerability and recognition precede the act of conscience. Until you are vulnerably disposed, until you're capable of being open and responsive to the other and not, not constantly thinking of yourself, that's what the brothers of Joseph are doing. They're constantly thinking of themselves. They're never thinking of <laughs> Joseph, you know, like what they did to him. They're unable to acknowledge that. Until they do that, they're not being vulnerable. They're not being able to recognize. And, and, and yet, Joseph is trying to teach them, you did wrong, and you need to acknowledge it, because you need to acknowledge it for my sake, because guess what? God has already delivered me, and God delivered all the people of Egypt and of Israel because you threw me in the well. So God took care of everything but you people. And the only people who can benefit by you confessing now and acknowledging your guilt is yourself. And then they have a conscience, not until they confess their guilt. So I, I actually deplore people invoking their con I find it so tiresome when somebody says, 
I'm sorry, I have to follow my conscience. They say, well, I presume you were doing that for your whole life, or is it just this moment? Are you talking about it just in this moment? And most people are. And that's why I don't think that there's really a conscience operative until somebody acknowledges their own guilt collectively. And, and if I can just toss this in uh, onto this, I think when I keep saying socially and personally, it's very hard for me to distinguish, say on my, I, I talked about my racism last week, about how I turned the newspaper, how I read the newspapers, um, and, and how, the, you know, these actions of mine, where, where is my personal conscience and where is my social conscience? Where are they distinguishable? My, my turning that page has a lot to deal with everybody else in the room, too, who's turning the page as well. My, my conscience is never simply personal. My conscience is always engaged socially. That's what I'm trying to do, is to try to keep that actual reality of conscience, not that we privilege it as being something singularly within me. It's something that I share with others, and I allow my conscientious development to be something socially engaged. I'll be briefer in the next answer. <laughs> Excellent. Question. Emmanuel. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, quite interesting. Would you say a little more about shame, the relationship yeah. between conscience and, and, and shame? Yeah. And especially since you're talking about to social conscience, what happens if, as a nation, as a culture, as a community, we have lost a sense of shame? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in the dynamics between shame and, and conscience as you see them yeah. developing toward this social. I was afraid of a question on shame because I decided that the only way I could do a 50-minute lecture was by still talking about guilt. If I entered shame into this, it would be really problematic. And therefore, I do think I, what I said is key. That is, that until the conscience acknowledges its guilt, it is not a conscience. It is not born. And I, don't, I think that shame is, is, is if you will, a, a, a way of manipulating people to s sense that they need to be uh, ex acceptable. So the, all the language of shame is always deeply connected, and, and punishment about shame is always deeply connected to being alienated, to being alienated. So I didn't want to go through down that road. Uh, what we do see is we're shaming Russia now. Um, that the sh public shaming of Russia is something. We, why? We want Russia to stop it. But public shaming is, I think, a short-term type thing. I'm more interested in guilt. That when I teach my students, they all want to talk about shame. And I understand that. I mean, I, I really see a great deal of issues with shame. But when it comes to ethics, I want to hear guilt. I want guilt to be acknowledged. I want somebody to own up to what they did, to how they thought this way. I think guilt is more an acknowledgment of what I did rather than what I felt from your uh, admonition of me and your withdrawal of your approval of me. Guilt is, there's a lot of literature on this, and I think in, in the book I'm going to say, if you want to find out about shame, I'm going to do a brief bibliography and still avoid it. But I but think when you're that- talking about Europe, you say they felt an irreparable sense of shame. No. So that was shame in a positive direction, that kind of... I, I think that the only shame that happens is when Brian Stevenson tries to say to us, look at the lynching museum, or if um, uh, Jews say, look what you did to us, or gypsies say that, or homosexuals say that in Europe, you know, that they're trying to provoke this. That shaming is a way of, of invoking people to prompt them to respond, and to, but what? To acknowledge guilt. So I think shaming is indeed a method to eliciting guilt. It's not unlike if, if, if Joseph started to try to shame his brothers to get them to elicit guilt. So I have no problem with shame, but I want to, I want to raise up guilt because we don't have anyone acknowledging what's happening in our world responsibly. Name, name me a person who's, uh, I mean, okay, say Pope Francis. Name me a person in political leadership who takes ownership of her or his actions and collectively allows his or her country to, to take ownership for the way they throw refugees out, the way they put them on a plane, the way they do. What, these different actions, who's taking ownership? Guilt. We talk a lot about shame. I'm trying to restore a dialogue on guilt. So that's what I'm 
trying to do here. But uh, I want to acknowledge, there's two people here I want to acknowledge in a particular way. The man who just asked the question is Emmanuel Cantangole, a colleague of mine, who's been to our conferences. He was one of the closing lecturers in Sarajevo. Um, he's here uh, at Oxford for the first time giving lectures at a, an institute right now. He gave a major lecture last night. And then there's Jane Leake here, another friend of mine who's been with me and working with me in all the projects that I've been involved in for the past 20 years. So I'm honored by people who are listening here uh, who come not knowing me, but there are others who come knowing me quite well for quite some time, like Nick. Um, uh, but there are two here tonight that I need to acknowledge. talking about um, we and I, they, their, my own uh, sense of guilt of a, <coughs> took a course in, when I was in Boston with Matthew Potts uh, at the Harvard Divinity School on forgiveness. And he sort of problematized on the first day, who can forgive whom on whose behalf? So for example, if you punch me and I find it in my heart to, to forgive you after my you know, wounded body or ego um, and then we make peace, but if you punch my brother, is it in my place to yeah. forgive you? Yeah. Um, and if I, you know, when that, when that gets played out over the distance of generations, and there's a, a promotion from the actual event that would have been, um, and I, it just put me in mind of, when I was up as a Jesuit novice uh, working with the Lakota Sioux, and kind of the deep memory of hurt around everything there with religion and the government, and you had students who were part Lakota with a French fur trapper last name who themselves felt a, a certain division or frustration because some of their ancestors were cruel to other ancestors of theirs. And so I guess the question for me and maybe to you is how does one suss out and assess that guilt in a way that doesn't impugn people unjustly so that you don't create a resentful re reaction that says, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with this because I wasn't there or you know, how, how do you how do you na navigate that in a way well, to I avoid think, a, a resentful? I think we attend too much to that fear about resentfulness, and we don't attend to the fact that by staying in the situation we are, we're still in that toxic place where we cannot hear truth adequately. My argument is that until we acknowledge guilt, we're not able to reason well. Uh, we don't have, the conscience is not born, it's not capable of admitting the truth into our lives. The act of acknowledging guilt says I will be, I will be measured by truth. I think we worry too much. So with the Vietnam Memorial, we think of all the different men and women who were drafted and were taken into that war and, and, and all they suffered. So we don't raise questions about you know, how complicit was the United States as a people involved in that war, not knowing what needed to be known and finding out what needed to be found out. And, and so we stay away from dealing with that issue, but we stay away because we don't want to harm these other people. I understand that, but that keeps us, it, that keeps us under a lid in, in a, a toxic environment where we're not paying attention to things. I guess my question is, who, who is the we in that? It's just us. It is just us. And, and so we're having discussions we're having, we're having discussions that are not really adequate because we don't have the capability yet to acknowledge truth, to say that truth will judge how we need to proceed. We're, we're already working on forgiveness when we haven't worked, in, worked out adequate methods of expressing guilt. Um, and I, that's what I'm more, I, I haven't even gotten to how you forgive. I'm just trying to get people to acknowledge guilt to the first step. Then we can talk about, then we can talk about forgiveness because we've acknowledged guilt and we've allowed truth to come in. The, the phenomenology of acknowledging guilt, what Bokla does this, in this whole book, is really rather important that we're unable to see the truth of the situation because we have cluttered, cluttered the narrative with all sorts of excuses and all sorts of what happens if, instead of saying this is the truth. We have time for one last question. Joe. Sure. 
challenge to name one political leader who's actually taken okay. responsibility for collective guilt. And I, of course, cannot do that. But I was also going to remind of uh, Ryan Hoogenweaver's book, Moral Man, Immoral Society, where he actually points out that dynamic of the individuals can take responsibility in a way that large collectives seem perhaps una unable to do. And I wonder whether your, your, your comments for the beginning of your lecture helped go to that, that challenge. So let me just uh, use as a, a close on an example. I was going to tell you a story of where I had guilt. Now I want to say, um, I, I'm going to close it with a little uh, story that happened about acknowledging guilt, um, just as a way of responding and closing up this evening. So um, when it was turning my 40th birthday, I wrote an essay um, on how I I, I realized that I was much more capable of doing things right than when I was in my 20s. When I was in my 20s, I promised everything and I delivered sometimes. Um, and when I was, now I was 40, I realized I was much more competent. But <laughs> I wondered, did I love as much as I did in my 20s now that I was 40? And then I began to reflect on, on what I called the dangers of Phariseeism. I said that I wondered whether or not I actually um, was more interested in just getting the right done without any love, without something else underneath it. And so I wrote this, and it was published. And then the center that I had a fellowship with, at the Center for Theological Inquiry at Princeton, they loved it, and they published it. And I returned to Boston, uh, to Western School of Theology where I was teaching, and a man who I've mentioned now twice in these lectures, Daniel Harrington, was sitting up in his office, and I walked in, and he said, oh, welcome back. And I said, thank you, Dan. And he said, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And I said, why is that? And he said, you're going to get a lot of people writing to you about that article on Phariseeism. You just indicted Pharisees as being hypocritical, and you used this cheap shot at them and people are going to say, aren't you a responsible human being that you're casting aspersions against Jews? And basically, this, is a, this shows some of your anti-Semitism. I said, that's nonsense. He said, it is there, and you did it. And I said, so the letters started coming. So I started writing things. I said, you know, my brother is married to a Jewish woman. I have two Jewish nephews. I'm doing everything to explain this and all. And then I kept thinking. The term Phariseeism is used just the way the term Jesuitism is used. You know, you want to talk about two people who collectively have been considered hypocrites in history? Pharisees and Jesuits. They, you, the same Pharisaical word is there for both. And so I, you know, the same hypocritical word is there for both Pharisees and, and Jesuits. And so I, I wrote this thing, this statement, and I said, you know, I should have known better. As a Jesuit, I've heard people just judge us collectively, and I should have known this better. I should have known this, I recognize. It was not known, but I should have known it. And therefore, um, you know, I want to own up to that now. And then Dan said, now right, and I was wrong. <laughs> and I said, there's no need to do that. I have acknowledged everything. What else is there to acknowledge? He said, right, and I was wrong. And I said, I don't need to write as I was. This goes to my point about the Joseph story, how long it takes to acknowledge wrong. So I said, he said, write it. So I put down, and I was wrong. A week later, um, what's his name in Chicago, the great historian, he's, he, I don't know, very famous, uh, Martin Marty. Uh, Martin Marty writes an essay. I have read um, of a moral theologian who acknowledged he was wrong. It's the first time I've ever seen it. So thank you, uh, and have a pleasant evening. And I just want to remind everyone to, to come next time for next week's lecture, which is on the call of discipleship. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Daniel.